Welcome to the Twimmel AI Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. Before we get to today's episode, I'd like to send a huge thank you to our friends at Qualcomm for their support of the podcast and their sponsorship of this series. Qualcomm AI Research is dedicated to advancing AI to make its core capabilities, perception, reasoning, and action ubiquitous across devices. Their work makes it possible for billions of users around the world to have AI-enhanced experiences on Qualcomm technologies powered devices. To learn more about what Qualcomm is up to on the research front, visit twimmelai.com slash Qualcomm, Q-U-A-L-C-O-M-M. And now on to the show. All right, everyone, I am here with Julian Quiroga. Julian is computer vision team lead at Genius Sports. Julian, welcome to the Twimmel AI podcast. Hi, Sam. Uh, hey, it's great to have you on the show, and I'm looking forward to digging into your paper, which you'll be presenting at CVPR in the Computer Vision in Sports Workshop. But before we do, I would love to have you share a little bit about your background and uh, how you came to work in Computer Vision. Yeah, sure. Right now, I'm the Computer Vision team lead at Genius Sports. Yeah, I'm responsible for leading applied research in video understanding and videography. Um, I work together with a team of scientists and engineers trying to get the best technologies for the company. Before joining uh, Genius Sports, I was an associate professor in a university in Bogota uh, doing re research in signal processing, image processing, and computer vision. But I was contacted uh, by the company and they offered me to uh, join them for a very exciting uh, kind of products with basketball. And since I played basketball since I was like 10 years old, so it was so uh, exciting and I accepted the offer. Um, yeah, I did a PhD in informatics and mathematics in France, yeah. But before that, I was m m working more in signal processing and all the theoretical aspects. But then I started to work with images and video, and that's what I'm doing right now. All right, cool. And uh, tell us a little bit about Genius Sports and uh, some of the, the things that you do with computer vision uh, at the company. Yeah, sure. So Genius Sports is a leading company in sports data and sports media and all the regulated sports betting sectors. And it's specialized in the capture and distribution of real time data. Uh, in particular, in my case, yeah, uh, we are doing more of applied research, trying to do like video understanding and videography to get automatic production and to collect data in real time. This data will enrich the kind of data that we provide to our partners. Um, some of the projects that they're working right now, they are related with automatic production with single and multiple views, yeah? Mm -hmm. And also uh, the collection of data in the edge, really close to the event, to the sport event, for instance, basketball uh, and volleyball, and in a really short uh, period of, of time. How much of what the company does is focused on uh, or related to vision data versus other types of data sources? Yeah, so actually we started like two years ago, I think, when I joined the company. Yeah, okay. so we are really new uh, um, in comparison Computer with vision other. Vision yeah, 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 okay. yeah. yeah. I, I guess you, you mentioned some of the, the, the broad things that you're doing there, but you're, I guess in terms of your, you mentioned that your focus is like applied research. Yeah, what are some of the the projects that you're focused on? Yeah, so the first one is automatic production. It can sound like, what is that? But it depends. And also the complexity, it depends. So for the case of the paper that I will, that we are gonna, it's a single camera that's able to observe the full the full court or fill. So the idea is just to generate a, a virtual camera, but there are other scenarios when you have more than one camera in order to produce a higher quality production, every switching and doing some uh, transition between cameras. So 
in this in the um, simple scenario when you only have one camera the idea is just to uh, get the proper frame and to track the main actions yeah uh, in real time of course uh, but when you have more than one camera you have to uh, bring to the spectators like a better experience of the event and trying to select the proper point of view for each action so the problem is more shutting you Mm -hmm. And so the the paper that you're presenting at CVPR uh, is that a single camera only, or does it include multiple camera scenarios? Yeah. So this paper is for basketball and is with a single view. And the main goal is to produce a high quality uh, production that is really fast, uh, because for sports events, the latency uh, of these uh, broadcasts is quite important. So if you want to do uh, any processing of this uh, video, you don't want to add uh, like a large latency. So actually in our work, we are able to just add like three, uh, three, uh, 300 or 400 milliseconds yeah, oh, wow. for HD. So this is really important. But however, there are other components in the streaming procedure that they are adding more time. So the idea of this technology is to be able to produce this high quality uh, production without adding uh, like a large latency to the full pipeline in order to uh, get this broadcast to the spectators. Okay, and if um, folks are, are listening and would like to take a look at the, the demonstration of the project, we've got that, uh, we'll have that in the show notes. It's up on YouTube. And it's pretty cool. You start out with this kind of wide frame view of a basketball court and you show by adding additional layers of information that you can localize the ball and localize the players and know which part of the court the action is going to be on and kind of pan the camera back and forth and, and zoom in and zoom out. Um, the it, this So at the end result is a, you know, as, as the, you've described and as the paper is titled kind of a, an automated production where presumably you can just kind of point this camera that's connected to a model uh at a basketball court and it'll produce something that's kind of watchable and engaging and interesting as opposed to just the one zoomed out view when we're talking about um sports production today like i would imagine you've got a pretty broad range of what's actually done like you've got you know, maybe at high schools or, or um, maybe even some colleges, you know, a single video that's without an operator that's just recording. And then, you know, certainly in the professional sports, you probably have teams of people creating a production. Can you, is the goal here to, to produce something that is kind of productized and replaces one or more of those scenarios? Yeah, so one of the ideas with this uh, project is to um, enable some people and, and college and schools that they are not able to have a, like a professional uh, cameraman or something like that, yeah, to be able to record their games, yeah, but not only to record the games, but also to record and to stream them to wherever uh, point, yeah. Mm -hmm. through the internet yeah so uh, you know parents uh, family friends our fans can watch the game of their favorite team yeah without an uh, expensive system of capture and production and and streaming yeah this is one 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 part the other part is that um, we are able to do the auto production yeah with the scene uh, as you mentioned uh, with the wide view, we have the full information and at the same time later, we are also working on that, we can capture at the same time uh, data, more data, locations and um, analytics and also embed that uh, in, the, in the same uh, broadcast yeah, mm -hmm. and also with low latency. And so is the, the setup that you've got a single high resolution camera and the panning and zooming is all done digitally or are you actually controlling the a camera? Exactly, so actually it's a fixed camera. Uh, it depends of the, um, on the field, yeah, uh, and the distance. It should be a, a wide angle, ultra wide angle or a standard camera. Now, if you have like a large venue, you can use whatever camera, but if not, you will need like a wide angle or ultra wide angle. Yeah, and then all the production is over a virtual camera. So it's just okay. like a digital crop or digital zoom, yeah, 
trying to get that. So there's an important trade-off here is that you want to uh, contain the main action uh, inside this virtual camera, but it's really easy. I mean, if you are not doing any production, you are containing the main action, yeah. Right. But you have to crop, yeah? But you have to crop enough in order to get the attention of the spectator to the main action. So there is a trade-off that you don't want to lose any action, mm -hmm. yeah? But you want to contain the action. So it should be like large and small enough to contain properly that. And it depends on the kind of basketball they are. So, I mean, imagine NBA, NCAA, something like that, or college basketball or kids or something like that. The, uh, the speed of the game, that's going to be different. So you can incorporate that in order to have like a smooth, a smooth enough production, but you don't want to lose any, any action. And what resolution cameras have you uh, worked with out of Kira? Yeah. So our standard setup is a 4K camera. Okay. Yeah. And the uh, resolution of the product, uh, produced game, it depends. If you are doing streaming, perhaps not so high, but it could be like full HD or HD. If you are just recording, yeah, it, it can be full HD, yeah. It depends of also on the internet connectivity or if you only want to record. If you only want to record, it can be like full HD. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, so I mentioned in the, the demo, you, you roll through at the beginning a set of layers showing localizing the players and, and the ball and things like that. Um, you actually show quite a bit uh, of information overlaid onto the screen in the demo. Uh, what what are the, the main contributions of the, the paper? Yeah, so right now with deep learning, I think that uh, we are pushing a lot with trying to get like end-to-end -end systems, yeah? Um, uh, instead of that, we wanted to have like a more modular system, yeah? Going to the basics of the of team sports. Like, I'm trying to get like a bottom-up system. So in basketball, you have your ingredients. Yeah, you have your players, you have referees, and you have the ball, mm -hmm. and that's it. So we wanted to construct something based on that and trying to get good solution for localizing the ball and players and reps in time, yeah, and then trying to build really nice uh, rules of production that can behave well depending on the different kind of basketball, yeah. And, and there is a good thing is that in the company, we are a lot of people that love basketball. So actually uh, we use it all this knowledge and all this uh, experience trying to get good rules of production that perhaps in this end-to-end -end, um, approach is quite hard because you're gonna have a reference, yeah? And you want to have this crop in order to fool this and that. But depending on the kind of basketball is not so intuitive and not so easy to include these kind of rules. But in our approach that is modular, yeah, you have your ingredients or your model or the lo um, locations of your actors, in this case, ball and players, and we take out the, the ref. And then depending on that, we can at every time select the proper uh, crop for the action. So what are the main con contribution? First of all, it's like a full pipeline, yeah that um, the more data you are getting of basketball games, um, the detector that you have for ball and player, they, work, they will work better. So you're gonna be always in the right position. And also it can easily uh, be uh, implemented in any field, yeah? And it's not expensive and it's working in real time. Okay, uh, so I think you, you packed a lot into that explanation. Well, one, one question that jumped out at me was you mentioned that you, you start with these ingredients and identifying where the players are in the ball. Uh, and then you mentioned having rules to determine what the optimal crop and, and zoom are. When you, do you mean those rules literally meaning that, that the deep learning is doing the detection and, and localizing the, the ingredients and then you've got a set of static rules that uh, are based on that information that do the production or is the production also part of a, a learned model? Yeah, so the learned model is, um, there are two main components that they are learned. One is uh, the actors, both and players, and the other one is what is the game state because depending on the state of the game, you want to follow one rule or you want to do something, you want to be more uh, attentive or you want to be 
almost still it depends yeah but we are not trying to learn the proper uh, virtual camera yeah, yeah. Uh, that was a, a choice that we did yeah uh, I, I remember that when discussing the different approaches that we could take uh, they are really similar configuration of players yeah and depending on the ball, you want to frame that um, action in one way or in another. So you have to first, to, you have to be aware of what is the ball, yeah? Mm -hmm. But not only the ball is directing what is the proper framing. And you have to be aware of the players and player distribution, yeah? But not only this distribution will tell you what is the proper frame. And you need a combination of these two, depending on the game state. And sometimes, I mean, in end-to-end -end, um, approaches, yeah. If you want to state that like end-to-end, -end, you have all your ingredients or even your raw video, and then you want like an output, the proper framing, yeah. And it's gonna be like a black box. Mm -hmm. And trying to adjust that for one kind of basketball or one kind of uh, thing, that's gonna be quite hard. This is what uh, we did this choice. And, and yeah, so it's really, it's quite easy to set one kind of behavior for what kind of basketball. Okay. Okay. What, when you say one kind of basketball, what are examples of kinds of basketballs that would change the way you would frame Yeah. So, yeah. So there are some challenge when you want to, to produce basketball with really, uh, with a really nice zoom. Yeah, and just for instance, if you see the production that they are doing for NCAA or for NBA, it's quite different. Yeah, NCAA, usually they are just having like a almost still camera in the half court or half court possession, and then just they are just moving for the transition and that's it. For the NBA, they really want to track and to do more zoom when they are during a half court. So this is like a two kind of, uh, production but mm. by kind of basketball i'm talking about the maximum speed so the main challenge when you are trying to do that is someone that is really fast like lebron james or something like that yeah and you want to track the main action but you don't want to disturb the the, um, the people that are watching the production yeah. so you have a trade-off yeah. yeah so if you already know that your basketball is not going to be so fast yeah, you can have like a maximum speed of the virtual camera and things like that. And be sure that you're, you're gonna be able to track the main action. But if your basketball is quite fast and you don't want to lose the main action, so you have to relax somehow your roles in order to always be in the right position. Okay, yeah? okay. So the modular approach, it sounds like it allows you to, it gives you a little bit more kind of knobs for addressing these different characteristics of, of games in terms of faster and slower. And also uh, it sounds a little bit like it, it will allow maybe in more of a professional setting, if this is deployed, the whoever's using it to kind of tune in a personality for the way they want the video to, to kind of feel. You mean you know, NCAA versus NBA, for example. Yeah, yeah. And even for the case of NCAA, um, between men and women, it's totally different. Usually uh, for women, the point guard is really close to the half court with the, with the ball. So if you want to take a look at the point guard and also the action that is taking place under the basket, you need a wider framing. But for men, it's totally different. They are moving different. So, you, so there are something that, I mean, we are not trained to learn that, but it's also possible to learn that and to avoid feeling that by hand or by the satisfaction of customer that is usually what we are doing. Yeah, mm -hmm. sometimes there, some uh, customer, they prefer this kind of production that other, but it's quite easy to transfer that in our, uh, in our models. Yeah, that is not so easy for our end-to-end uh, system that you have to change your your last function or your data or whatever else yeah uh, and retrain <laughs> yeah. you you also overlay this graph of gaussian based actionness in in the video and it, it seems to uh try to capture where the action you know is or is likely to be on the the court can you talk a little bit more about that uh that metric and and you know what goes into it yeah, sure. So the first thing is that we are modeling players like uh, two-dimensional Gaussians in the court. That is quite intuitive. Yeah. So since we have like a core model, it's quite easy to have like uh, shapes um, with the proper size in pixels in the image. Yeah. 
and also to, to map that to, uh, to a 2D history. And so we are able to model the distribution of players. And our hypothesis is that uh, if players are more concentrated in a given area of the court, it's more likely to have like more action there or, or something interesting that will happen, mm -hmm. yeah? Uh, imagine that half of players they are in one half court or the other half is in the other half court. So surely they are in the timeouts or something like that. Yeah, and it's quite hard to decide where I should look or perhaps I should do a zoom out, yeah? Yeah, something like that. Uh, so this is one thing. The other thing that you can easily think is, okay, if you have the ball, you only need the ball, right? And you can track the ball like in soccer or something similar or in volleyball, I don't know, yeah? And yeah, but there are a lot of interesting things that you also want to see. You, you, you not only want to see someone with the ball like that and everyone in the key area taking screens and doing a lot of things and trying to get free for a, sh uh, for a shot. So it's quite interesting. So this function is trying to describe this livelihood, yeah? But alone, it's not so useful because we know that we have to, uh, that we want to have this ball. So what we are doing, we are taking each player and modeling this player as a 2D Gaussian. And then we get this action as function that is a mixture of the Gaussian, yeah? And depending on the complexity of the production that you want to do, you can take this distribution and take the optimal framing. I mean, you can also compute the um, um, amount of zoom to cover a lot of players or not. But in the paper and the video that we uh, share, this uh, simplification, we are just projecting uh, this to the uh, mixture of Gaussian to 1D, yeah? And we have like a 1D function and we just want, want to take the peak of this function as the center of the action. And then we just center the virtual camera in, um, at this value. And then with the ball, we take a look if the ball is inside or not. However, in basketball with a single view, it's very uh, likely that the ball is gonna be not visible or hard to detect because someone is taking the ball or hiding the ball or doing something and you don't want the system to be lost in this situation. So this action function is more stable, yeah? And the peak is not moving so fast because it's not possible that one player that is here is gonna be here in the next frame, yeah? So it's gonna be this kind of smoothness and we want to track this peak to get this uh, uh, like a good center for the virtual camera. Okay. Okay. Cool. So the the actor localization that I'm imagining is a supervised learning problem. You've got video. You've got you know someone's labeled your players with bounding boxes, and you just train a model to recognize uh, the players. Is that correct? Uh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, a classical deep learning a classical deep learning approach. Yeah. We have some examples of ball, some examples of referees, and some examples of players. At the class referee is not too easy for NCAA. The referees, they are always dressing the same, but it depends on the kind of basketball. Yeah, we want to take the players out, yeah, or at least to be aware of, of, of referees, sorry. We, um, yeah, and yeah, but it's totally supervised. And the uh, precision and recall of the, Detector, it depends. In our case, we use a YOLO version 3. Yeah, now it's available oh. YOLO, YOLO version 4, and today's I go like your YOLO version 5. But there's some yeah. controversy over whether it's real YOLO or something. Else. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, so the nice thing of this approach is the bird, the, uh, when a bird detector and a faster is available, we can just plug here. Yeah, okay. and be more confident on the detection of our actors. Yeah. And also we are using our core model in order to uh, do not train over the raw image, but we transform the image according to the uh, core model. So we ensure that the uh, network is only observer, uh, observing the area of the court, yeah? And there are some um, proportion when we are doing this transformation that make the job easier for the detector. So this is why even under large um, overlap, we are able to detect players with a really good accuracy. Uh, so elaborate on that a little bit more. It sounds like you're saying you, you, you have YOLO as the detector and that's operating on still frames, um, correct? Yep. And, and you're, you're, you've also got this model for the court that 
you know, the angle of your camera. And I'm assuming we're talking about like the 3D model of the court and like uh, the 2D, 3D projections and that kind of thing. Is that what you're referring to? With the yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So since the camera is fixed, uh, we localize the, the court or, mm -hmm. I mean, we localize the camera. You can see one side or the other, but it's, it's equivalent. So we can compute actually a court volume. So like the projection of a court uh, of a volume of interest, imagine like a four meter high, five meter high volume in the image. So we can take this region, yeah, and actually to crop and transform that and feed the network when we are training, yeah. And this will ensure that the variance of the uh, sizes for the object that's gonna be not so high and can be more specialized in order to detect the players because it's not expecting whatever size of players and things like that, yeah. So how tightly cropped around uh, a player is the image that you're feeding to the detector? Is it, is it very tightly cropped or is it, you know, half court or, or something like that? No, no, no. It's, it's, the, it's the full court. Yeah, but okay. imagine that we are taking out everything that is not the court and just taking like a crop that exactly contains okay. uh, all the pixels of this volume. And the players there, uh, they are going to look... Uh, similar in shape i mean it's not likely to have like a player in this transformation that that's going to be the double or, or three times the size of others so the number of of, of anchors for jolo it's going to be um, um a smaller number yeah okay and, and so you mentioned earlier that part of your uh your the contribution of this paper is um, being able to, at least what I took as being able to do this kind of actor detection and localization in a, in a short time frame, can you elaborate a little bit more on if you've, you've got the out of the box detector, what pieces are you doing on top of that? Yeah. So then that when, when we have all these, uh, detection of actors, they depend a lot on Jolo uh, version three. Yeah, and mm -hmm. it's going to be faster when a new detector or faster. Oh, well. So actually, we did like some changes in Jolo. Uh, usually, Jolo is not so good for small objects, but in basketball, there is one small object that is really important. <laughs> that is the that is the ball. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, um, uh, that. There's like a, a map that is uh, component different uh, layers. We modify one layer in order to take uh, the layer eleven. That is able to get a uh, so interesting feature of small objects uh, till 14 times 14 uh, size. Yeah. And this enables us to detect the ball in a more uh, consistent uh, way. So, mm -hmm. starting with these detections, then we, we use our core model again to localize the players in, this, in, in the core plane and to create this action as function. Yeah. But then or also we get uh, to the histograms that is trying to estimate uh, what is the state of the game. Yeah, if it is a half core or uh, timeout or a transition or something like that in order to switch for the proper role mm. yeah, of the production. And yeah. Is, the, that only, is that based solely on player position, the yeah. game state? Yeah, 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 yeah. So for this paper, yeah, but uh, of course, you want to also add the temporal information, yeah, because you yeah. can you can have like a distribution of players for different situations, yeah. But the story, it's uh, yeah. I mean, sorry, I would imagine the if the history is very important, yeah. I'd imagine like right after a basket, if you're the ball is being inbounded, you're gonna want to to be zoomed out because you know the ball is gonna end up on the other side of the court quickly or something like that. Like there's incorporating in the knowledge about not just where the, the the players are and where the ball is but like what's actually happening from a semantic perspective could be interesting an interesting yeah. signal yeah, yeah yeah so actually right now we are trying to uh, move forward with this uh we're including more things okay. at the beginning we really want to have like a live but accurate enough method for production without trying to get all these components uh, yeah. and trying to have like something because we really want to be really fast yeah and trying to build on that. But then depending on the challenge, and there are some challenges that the system is failing. Sometimes you don't want to lose a small part of the transition, or you are trying to follow someone that is going with the ball and you arrive a bit late. 
yeah mm -hmm. and yeah sometimes it's is is happening yeah but they are really uh small cases yeah so uh, it's light because it's combining all these ingredients yeah the action uh, the game state and then there is a controller that is really simple and depending on the state it's deciding something yeah and producing a really high quality and however they are something that i really like to have like trying to have more zoom and a variety of zooms framings uh, be, uh during the half court possession, trying to be more like tracking the action, yeah. But it needs more um, awareness. The system really needs to understand more states inside uh, the half court state, for instance, like a screen in the key area, or someone is preparing for taking a three pointer or something like that. Yeah. So our idea is to is to increase the number of states, yeah because this number of state will increase the number of uh, rules of production that we can have. Okay. And are the the rules for your controller, are those handcrafted or are those learned as well? Yeah. Um, so we have this core volume. Yeah. Yep. And so imagine that would you want to have like a zoom out It's quite easy. You already know your core volume and you can find like uh, the optimal framing that contain this core volume, the full core volume, and is well centered, yeah? But then we also have another frames. For instance, the left, uh, the left half core framing, yeah? Mm -hmm. And the right half, half core framing, but also you can have a lot of set of framings or you can have a continuous, yeah? In our case, we have a discrete uh, set of framings inside each half court, and depending of the peak of the action is, we are just moving, to the proper uh, framing inside the half court. Yeah, this, uh, this is like a easy solution for the problem, but you can also have like a continuous. But I will be honest, uh, with this discrete set of uh, framings, the quality is really good, yeah. yeah. But the solution, it will be better with a continuous uh, uh, set of framings inside that. Yeah, and to be clear, when you, you, you have a discrete set of framings, but the, um, the virtual camera is not jumping from one discrete place to another. It's a smooth transition from one to it's, the next. So exactly. it looks yeah. pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, um, so yeah, and for doing that, it's actually it's quite easy. It's just a proportional uh, control when uh, moving from this uh, framing to the desired framing and trying to obey a maximum speed of the virtual camera because we don't want to perturb uh these data uh and so still with the you've got this discrete set of uh of views did you just write down the rules you know the correspondence between the the game state and the the framing or did you try to learn <clears throat> that kind of way no no there are so for the transition is just a free camera yeah, so it's a virtual transition from one to another. I get that's just following PID or proportion. Yeah, no, no, no. Sorry. So, so imagine that uh, I think that the two main uh, states of the game are transition when we are moving to uh, one half court to the other, and the half court position. So okay. we expect that they're gonna remain there for uh, 15, 20, 24 seconds, something like that. Yeah. yeah. For during a transition, the camera is like a free camera. Yeah, trying mm -hmm. to be smooth but trying to contain uh, the main action or the peak of the action is and the ball at the same time. And there is a trade up there, but the, the ball, if it's uh, visible, it should be contained. Yeah. Okay. And it's trying to do like a free camera, but in the half court, yeah, we know that we want to be in this half court. So we are moving to the set of discrete uh, views or framings. Yeah. And we are choosing uh, the framing that is more or that is closer to the peak of the action is. And if we were in a different framing, we are just doing a, pro, a pro, proportional motion to the next framing. Yeah. Got it. And, okay. and that's it. And the, in the, the demo, that's a 2D projection, but the peak of the action is in 3D on your court model, right? Or uh, it, because you you also, see you're also zooming in and out. Yeah. So actually, the peak of the action is, is, uh, is in 2D. So okay because the domain of this function is, is the chord plane. So for instance, yeah. I don't know, inside the key, in the middle of the key, in the, I don't know, 
something like that, yeah. Uh, for a single camera, yeah, and if you don't want to do a lot of zoom during half court position and things like that, you can just project to 1D and to select or uh, like a like a panning motion of your virtual camera. Yeah, but if you really want to uh, do like a full professional with zooming and uh, and zoom out and everything, you can exploit these actions in 2D and to be aware the action is, is in the other corner of the half court and trying to be more close to the action and to exploit better the pixel that you want to uh, to broadcast. Cool. And so you, you've suggested a few of the next steps here. Can you maybe talk a little bit more about, you know, where you go based on this or or have you, are there even other papers that you've already published beyond? Uh... <laughs> yeah, I, I, I cannot say it a lot. Yeah, but uh, one of our main efforts right now is trying to improve some things. The lighting of the venue sometimes is making things difficult. Yeah, and yeah, so imagine that, uh, that the ball is not detected for some reason. You have a lot of windows and you have a lot of uh, change in illumination and shadows and things like that. Mm -hmm. And the ball is, is, is uh, the ball detector is failing. Yeah, so you're gonna be, I mean, all your production is gonna be based in the actions function. Yeah, and mm -hmm. you don't have all your ingredients and we can fail. So we are trying to get more robust detector and to get more data, yeah, because the ball detector is totally uh, data driven. So we need the more data that we can have in order to teach the, the network to detect any ball in basketball. Yeah, and if we have the ball, the method is quite good. The other thing that we want to do is to optimize some things. Uh, of course, in order to run Jodo, you need a GPU, yeah? And this kind of GPU or server that you are using will determine uh, your inference time, yeah? So if you want to be fast enough, you need a good server, but perhaps uh, you want to do that locally in the edge, yeah. yeah? And it's not so easy to afford this kind of server for a public school or for a college or something like that, yeah? So if we can get a better detector that can run really fast in CPU or a very cheap GPU or something like that, we are trying to move that and to get like lighter a uh, detector that, are, that they are doing a good job. Um, yeah, but if you have a good server or a good internet and you can just stream to the cloud and we process in the cloud, we are good enough. So right now we are trying to get like a more optimized version and trying to run with our detector and to trying to correct some errors and some things that they are not so likely, but even if it's happening one time and again or two times, people that are not so happy, yeah? So mm -hmm. the idea is to be almost perfect. Yeah. But at the same time, we want to include more cameras, yeah? And trying to switch also like not expensive cameras, yeah? But trying to switch um, among these cameras. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, since we are already aware of the location of players, at the same time without the production, we are collecting or we can collect uh, some statistics that they are gonna be really useful. Yeah, for players, for the coach, for fans, for everyone. Yeah, uh, in real time or after the game, it depends because the necessities are different. Yep. Mm -hmm. And have you already uh, tried using this method with other sports? You've mentioned soccer a couple of times. <clears throat> it, how generalizable? How easily generalized is it to you know similar but different sports? Yeah, uh, our belief is it should work. I mean. The the main uh, the first modules. I mean the actors and something like the core model or the field model for soccer and things like that. But the rules of production, if you are watching soccer or volleyball, they are going to be different. This is the really nice part, yeah, because mm -hmm. you, you don't have to change all your model. Yeah? yeah, you have your knowledge here or the knowledge of the location of the actors, but then you can uh, incorporate other kind of knowledge in a later stage like how you should produce soccer for one camera or for two or for 20 cameras or volleyball or any other sport. But the main ingredients, yeah, they are going to be the same. Yeah, but yeah, we we are trained that in other sports, yeah. So you're already, start, you're already starting to look at that? Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> any other uh, thoughts on, on future directions for, for this or you know, other things that you're excited about it, kind of this intersection of computer vision and sports? Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, 
I think that the ideal system is going to be, um, it will be like a system able to do this automatic production, but at the same time, providing these statistics and analytics for any kind of user. So for the players and coach in real time saying, okay, these are some statistics and even some analytics like, uh, yeah, but really you know, uh, with low latency and all the same package and with a single camera or something like that, you install and you get, and you have the full package. Actually, we are aiming that uh, mm. at, at, at this part. So you can have that, you can have your auto production, you can have all the data that you want, yeah, uh, with the same uh, system, yeah, and with with uh, low latency, this is, this is the goal. Well, Julian, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me about what you're up to. Okay, thank you, Sam, for the invitation, and see you later. All righty, thank you. All right, everyone, that's our show for today. For more information on today's show, visit twimlai.com slash shows. As always, thanks so much for listening and catch you next time.